So I'm going to try to talk about CAR T-cell therapy, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I don't do a good job, um, but hopefully I won't. Hopefully I will do a good job. And of course, every CAR T-cell therapy slide set does start off with a CAR doing a, uh, an impossible fat task. But what I really wanted to actually focus on today and sort of make everyone sort of aware of are the differences between these CAR therapies. So I think it's actually very interesting when we start talking about how there are different programs across the country all doing little twists. And we're now starting to learn a little bit about what works, what doesn't work. And what's really, I think, you know, the learning curve is very, very steep. But we're at a point now where we're really going to be able to maximize what we can actually accomplish with our CAR therapy. So first generation CARs, and remember CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptors. And so the chimeric antigen really is receptor. So this is a T cell receptor that really is manufactured in the lab. And it's really a single chain fragment variable region of an antibody. So that's what the SCFV stands for. And what, in essence, you have is an antibody attached to really what's part of a T cell receptor, in essence. But it's really a T cell receptor because it's just on the T cells and attacks antigen. Now, the original first generation car used this SCFV with the, CD30, with the CD8 transmembrane protein, which really just serves to hold it in place, and then the CD3 zeta protein to actually help activate the downstream signaling. What you can actually see here is that this first generation is really much um, less complicated, but it was also a lot less effective. So the cells went in, they attacked their antigens, but they really didn't have any ability to sustain themselves or to actually kill off their antigens. So what I want to focus on here is the number of co-stimulatory domains in this molecule was zero. And after a number of different experiments, it was really shown that adding in a co-stimulatory molecule, either CD28 or 41BB, also known as CD137, can really dramatically improve the ability of the T cells to survive and actually attack and kill their intended targets. So second generation cars use the same single chain uh, fragment of the variable region and then use a CD28 or a 41BB section in the membrane and then use a CD3 zeta chain as the intracellular signaling. And all of the ones that we've been currently hearing about in clinical trials are really second generation cars. And what I'd like to focus on is the differences. So University of Pennsylvania's is a 41BB car. So here in the membrane, it has a 41BB uh, protein. MSK and uh, University of Southern California, sorry, it should be University of California at San Diego, um, use CD28 in that membrane. So one of the differences between these two is this, these, I'm sorry, these three, is two of them use the CD28 and one of them uses a 41BB. But what's also different in these is this part here where the pen and memorial CART T cells are directed against CD19 and the UCSD CART is directed against ROR1. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So here it's a different antigen. And ultimately the thought process is that either we're going to be able to add additional units and make a third generation CAR, and you can see here that they've added in in addition to CD28, 41BB, or OX40, which is another TNF family member, to create a really highly functional CART, or we're just going to identify the perfect antigen that will enable these CART T cells to sustain themselves and to attack the CLL cells specifically. But currently, the second generation are what in clinical trials, and the differences you can see are really focused on either the co-stimulatory molecules or the target. So looking at the, uh, the original studies done in 14 patients at Penn, you can see here that the ma majority of the patients were heavily treated with a range of 1 to 11 prior therapies, um, and 43% were 17P deleted. The, oh, I apologize for this animation. Um, so what I really wanted to emphasize here is that the 
once patients are enrolled, there's a necessary delay that could really be anywhere from two to three months in generating the product. But one of the important things that I think we are beginning to now understand is that you need a lymphocyte depleting therapy to really enable the CAR T cells when they go in to actually have sort of vacancy in an area to grow. And it's sort of interesting because we've talked a lot about with, you know, B cell diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, sort of a, a flare that can happen after B cell depleting therapies with rituxan. You know, in essence, we're trying to capitalize on that now. So the actual bendamustine here isn't really meant to beat back the clone of CLL cells, but really just create space so that there is a push for more lymphocyte genesis. And here you could see the patients who are treated. What I really want to focus on here is we've had a, some CRs as well as PRs and quite a variability in the duration of um, follow-up to relapse. But here I want to just emphasize that there really doesn't seem to be any relationship between the number of T cells infused to the overall response. One of the things that really does seem to actually predict for response, and you can see here are the CRs and here are the PRs and here are the non-responders, is really persistence of the T cells. So it really looks like the data that we have thus far is getting the persistence of the T cells is really going to be the key to getting sustainable engraftment and continuous therapeutic benefit. Toxicities, you know, um, have been substantial, but we're sort of learning a lot of tricks in how well to control them. So no real infusion toxicities really looks just like a blood transfusion, but most patients experience a delay cytokine release syndrome characterized by high fevers, nausea, myalgias, capillary leak syndrome, hypoxemia, and hypotension. It does seem to be mediated in part, if not mostly, by IL-6. So using tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor, and now we also have siltuximab, which is approved, does seem to be used to actually help treat the uh, cytokine release syndrome without interfering with therapeutic benefit. And of course, steroids were also used very early on, more so because of obviously the urgency in wanting to control the situation, but they were shown to have some impact on the actual therapeutic benefit of the CAR T cells. So here's just a curve looking at all the patients, and what you can see here is really your median PFS is just shy of 12 months. Um, but we do have this nice, there really aren't too many people this far out, but we do have some potential patients that can be put into long-term remissions with CART therapy. I'm going to skip this. Um, so the thing I just want to say long-term about these patients is the overall response rate was 40%. Patients who had a CR had no MRD detected. So when you respond, you respond extremely well. And I think that's an important tell because the question, of course, is when you're seeing people with residual lymphadenopathy, is it active disease or not? Here we know that you know, MRD negativity is actually a very good predictor of outcome, or let me rephrase that, but is a very good indicator of the depth of remission. Um, responding patients had persistence of the CAR T cells, and that really, I think, is the most important th point to emphasize. But they did have absence of normal B cells, profound hypogammaglobulinemia, and required maintenance IVIG for life. And here's sort of a meta-analysis of all the different trials, and you can see here really how 60% becomes the overall response rate for all these different trials. So I'd like in the last two minutes just to talk about ROR1, which is actually a um, orphan receptor um, protein um, that was first identified, interestingly, from patients that were undergoing vaccination with CLL lymphocytes. These were um, in vivo vaccination attempts. And they actually made anti-ROR1 ROR1 antibodies. ROR1 is expressed on CLL cells, but not normal adult cells, with the exception of hematogones. ROR1 provides a growth and survival advantage for the CLL cells, and this is seen in vitro and in in vivo. Um, but 
what's also interesting is most of these ROR and ROR1 antibodies that we see in CLL patients actually have functional activity, and yet they still do allow the clone to exist. So ROR1 is a receptor tyrosine-like orphan receptor 1, evolutionarily conserved membrane protein um, that's expressed primarily during embryogenesis. And you can see that it's not expressed in any postpartum tissues with the exception of hematogones. And the expression really does seem to be restricted very nicely to CLLB cells. So in essence, this would be a way to really improve the targeting of our CAR T cells and really try to diminish other toxicities. And so this is the, the current CAR T cell that they're using at uh, University of California in San Diego using the CD28 co-stimulatory molecule and the um, single chain fragment variable region directed against ROR1. And you can see here that we do get extension, or they get extension of, um, expansion of the uh, CAR T cells very nicely. So the hope is, of course, that that will translate into very nice responses and long-term outcomes. And so with that, I thank you all.